Welcome to another exciting episode of Always Ageless with Valerie V, where we explore innovative and empowering ways for seniors to live their best lives. Today, I am thrilled to introduce a truly inspiring guest, Grincha Kingma from St. Louis, Missouri, known as the OT Realtor. Gretchen is not just a real estate professional. She's a dynamic force of creativity, intelligence, and compassion. Gretchen is the founder of Empowered Homes, where she seamlessly marries her background as an occupational therapist with her real estate expertise. Her mission to help seniors answer the crucial question of where should we go next? Gretchen educates and equips seniors to experience joyful aging on their own terms, ensuring they feel empowered to make their own best decisions. And isn't that what we all want is to make our own best decisions. As a dedicated mom, wife, and daughter of an aging parent, Gretchen brings a deeply personal understanding to her work. Today's show is not about real estate. It's about empowerment. You'll hear practical tips on how to make your space work for you, how to gain independence and comfort, and how to navigate smart housing choices. Gretchen has helped hundreds of seniors enhance their living experience, ensuring safety and comfort with her unique approach. Her dedication has made her a go-to hero to countless customers and their families and patients, I might add, which we'll hear about. So without further ado, let's dive into this conversation with Gretchen Kingma as she shares her wisdom on empowering seniors to live life their way. Welcome, Gretchen. Wow, Valerie, that was so kind and such the introduction. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on with you. We are so excited. We have a, a group of colleagues that are anxiously and enthusiastically listening also. So we're glad to have you with us. Gretchen, every great journey begins with an inspiring story. Could you share your background with us? I've heard about your deep connection with your family and especially your grandma. So how has that shaped your journey? Yeah, so my story begins actually way back when I was in undergrad at the University of Mississippi, and I graduated early, uh, a semester early because of some high school college credits that I had, but I wanted to stay in my college town just like any, you know, 21-year-old would. So my parents said, sure, that's fine. Go get a full-time job. And I I got my first full-time job was being a caregiver for a 96-year-old woman who Uh was a a prisoner of war in World War II and had sundowning dementia. She was a dynamic, fascinating human. She has since passed, so I can share her name. Her name is Annie McFadden, and I will never forget the time that I spent with her every single day for about six months. And I learned there how her environment drastically depend her how she was going to play out her day was drastically dependent on her environment with if it was cloudy, she had a terrible day. If it was bright and sunny, hot July day, she would do better. And so that fascinated me. Well, fast forward, I moved back to St. Louis to go to occupational therapy school and in OT school, I knew that I I wasn't going to be a pediatric therapist. I wanted to have kids and didn't want to ruin that experience for myself. So I was one of the few OT students that said, I'm going to work with the geriatric population. And I knew that from the start because of my experience with Annie and also my grandparents when I was in high school, they also um, declined pretty rapidly and ended up passing away in a senior living, a, a, a skilled nursing facility. So those two experiences launched me into OT school where I knew I wanted to work with seniors. Out of OT school, I worked in a in a inpatient rehab with adults. That wore on me very quickly because it wasn't just seniors. It was 19, 20, 21-year-old, uh, most of the time males that were having car accidents because of doing stupid things. And that really... Being an empath, that really was hard for me. Um, so I... I was there for about two years, and then I took a job at a senior living community because that was my passion. And and it was closer to home, so it was a win-win. But after being there for about four years, 
I was going on maternity leave and I realized that I had over 100 seniors on my caseload. And the max for the state of Missouri ethically was like 104 or something very close to 100. And I was really burnt out, which is a bummer because that's a short clinical career, only five, six years. And so I was handing off my my caseload to an occupational therapist that was going to be covering me for maternity leave. And I told my therapy director, I will see you in 12 weeks after I have this first kid. I have no idea what to expect. Went home that night and told my husband, I'm never going back. And we have only 12 weeks to fit, figure something out. And so that's when I pondered on what are the problems that I see in these senior lives that I am serving. And the number one consistent thread throughout everybody's story was home. No matter how independent we got them in the clinic, they still struggled at home. And many of them would return to therapy or have a re-hospitalization because home never changed. And so, you know, rocking a baby at two in the morning because they're screaming their head off, you have all the ideas. And I thought, gosh, if occupational therapist's role is to keep people happy, healthy, and thriving at home, then why are we not proactively looking and advocating for home? And that's what launched my career with Empowered Homes. That's quite a story. So just <laughs> let's take a second and explain to our viewers and our listeners exactly what is the difference between OT and PT? I love this question. And still educating my own parents on, on what the difference is. So OT and PT, a physical therapist is going to help you increase your strength, your balance, your endurance, and your range of motion. Occupational therapy is going to help you increase your strength, your balance, your endurance, and your range of motion, your cognition, but for a purpose so that you can fulfill the task that you want and need to do. So Physical therapist is very much so focused on the rote activity or the rote um, physical task. And the occupational therapist take that ability and apply it to an occupation. And occupation does not mean a job. It means how you spend your time. So what things do you do? I am a mother. That is an occupation. I am a friend. That is an occupation. So what things do I want and need to do after a major life event? OT is focused on that. So what, when was the moment when you said empowered homes is, is the answer? That's it. When was that time when you said, aha, what, what was your aha moment? Yeah, that's a great question. And empowered homes started first as a consulting company because I had a lot of shame around, gosh, I can't leave OT and go sling houses and be a realtor because real estate professionals don't always get a great reputation. And so I started as a consulting company and I thought, I'll partner with realtors. I'll partner with homeowners. And I quickly learned it's very hard to sell consulting services. So I wanted I wanted the homeowner to be empowered before. So I'm a very proactive thinker. I wanted a senior or even not a senior, an aging adult, a 35-year-old adult to proactively be thinking about how their home can enhance their health and well-being. And the, the word I just came back to when making that very first business plan was empowered. So did you then go right into real estate on your own? Yeah. So I, while on maternity leave with that newborn I was telling you about, I signed up for my real estate licensure class and I thought, I'm going to try this consulting thing, but I better get my real estate license just in case. And I met with a gentleman who I went to church with and he was actually on staff at my church and pivoted into real estate. His name's Adam Moskal. So shout out to Adam. I met with him. I told him all these ideas and he was like, Gretchen, this makes total sense. You need to come into real estate now. And so I waited for my husband to get home from his corporate finance job and I would go to real estate school at night. So he would keep the baby and I got licensed while on maternity leave and gave myself the benchmark of once I, I'm going to start doing this part-time and once I replace this occupational therapy clinical salary, then I'll go into real estate full-time. And I was able to do that within my first six months of being a business. And so I thought, okay, I have something here. Maybe I should embrace this a little bit more. And I went full speed ahead. 
So you did go back to your job as an OT for I actually didn't. I I picked up two PRN jobs, which is as needed or part-time jobs in home health. And I thought that home health would be wise because it would be another feather in my in my cap in the sense of continuum of care because I had the inpatient hospital rehab experience. I had the senior living experience, but I had never done home health and home is really where I wanted to focus. So I got two different jobs doing home health um, in order to increase my experience with patients in their home. So what exactly is Empowered Homes and how has it expanded? And I also hear that you have an Amazon store. So tell us about that, but tell us about Empowered Homes first. Yeah. So Empowered Homes is a super niched real estate company. We are under the umbrella of Keller Williams. That is our brokerage. And thankfully, they allow us to brand ourselves. So Empowered Homes isn't just a real estate company. We don't just help people buy, sell, or invest in real estate, but we also offer consulting services both locally and nationwide, where we partner with agents who have clients that maybe have disabilities or are aging and they want to, just like a home inspector inspects the integrity of a home, we work with agents and their clients to to consult on how livable will this home be long-term? How can it it grow with you? How accessible will it be for aging in place? Or I actually prefer the term living in place because I think aging in place sounds like decaying where you're stuck. It's just not that sexy. Um, So Empowered Homes is a super niche real estate practice that serves seniors and people with disabilities um, find new homes or modify their existing homes. I love what you just said about the living in place because our mission at at the show, Always Ageless, is not always aging. It's always ageless. And I wanted a show where we could talk about how to continue at no matter what age you are you can still have a a fun and lively and full life. So that's a great phrase. I I love that. (laughs) Tell us about your Amazon store. Yeah. So that was another, admittedly, I need to, I need to update it, but there are some very good things on there. And that came, that, that came out of a twofold experience. And I'm sure I never get interviewed without talking about my dad because that was, that was a huge part of my story. Um, But we'll get to that in a second. Amazon store came from, again, thinking about what are the gaps in healthcare. And as a clinical OT, our job was to send our patient when they discharge with many resources so that they wouldn't have that rehospitalization because hospitals are graded, they are scored, their funding comes from their patient satisfaction scores. And so a lot of the resources that we would send our patients home with would would bar on how they would score us in that follow-up survey. And it is 2024, and I have not been removed from clinical world too long, but the way that we would send recommendations home, we would highlight the website or we'd take a screenshot and we'd put it on a Word document and we'd have the patient go home and find it. And these are, you know, items that are going to make their life easier at home that aren't always, well, mostly never covered by Medicare. And so I thought, gosh, if I could just put things that I know have helped my patients in the past in one link where my OT friends could send it to their patients, it would streamline the process of people getting the equipment that would simplify life at home. So that's where that idea came from. And I actually built it when my dad, who wasn't quite to a senior level yet, he was only 58 when he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Mm. Um, And I was looking for things for him to make life easier. And so I was like, gosh, there are other people out there that are experiencing uh, disability secondary to health issue or major diagnosis that maybe this will help. So it all came together during that time. So when you're meeting with your clients, who who most of them come to you at Empowered Homes, is that true now? It is. And that's a great question because we do have a sister company called Custom Joy. Because Empowered Homes was getting so many construction um, construction adjacent projects, I was working... I was working with another occupational therapist who was a, a designer in my my market, and we had so many parallels and so many um, 
same clients that last year, about a year ago today, actually, we launched Custom Joy, which is Empowered Home Sister Company. So usually the intake comes through Empowered Homes and we perform a modified version of what's called an occupational profile, which we learned in OT school is the way to learn the client's needs, the wants and the goals of the client. And then from there, we decide which way which way they need to go through through our workflow process. Well, I have a question about that, but we'll hold it for, for just a few minutes. So when you're meeting with your clients, how do you convey the importance of the home they live in? And isn't that sometimes a sensitive topic? Isn't it sometimes um, a bit sensitive to talk about their home because everyone thinks they have a nice home? There are some people who will admit maybe they're hoarders, but most people, they've lived in this home. They've got pride of their home. So how do you approach that? Yeah, that that is a great question. And I would say a lot of that has come from my clinical skill set because we were having, you have hard conversations all the time in the hospital and in the clinic, Um, you know, just learning to deliver really hard news with a kind tone um, is, is super important. So I heard recently on an, they were interviewing on Bloomberg business late night this weekend. I was, I was watching an interview with the creator of Bumble, which is a dating app, which is totally not what we're talking about, but she said something that really struck me. She said, nice is fake. Kind is truth. And so that really struck me because it's not going to help anyone for us to be nice and puff up their house if they have 10 fall risk, but it's going to kind is delivering the truth in a way that um, just makes them aware of, of the, the fall risk of the barriers of the importance of the future. So I err on the side of just delivering truth and kindness. Great advice. And I love that phrase also. Yeah. About kindness being truth. In my many interviews, and uh, certainly I don't have an, very many yet, but in many of my interviews, the importance of planning ahead keeps coming up. When I ask people, what are your tips? What is your suggestions? Everyone says planning ahead, no matter what the subject is. So how do you encourage people to plan for the future? And more importantly, how do you how do you motivate them to take action? Yeah. So I think this is a great place for my family's story with my father. Um, for for me, I use a personal experience because my family did not plan ahead and we had to downsize my parents out of sheer necessity, not preparedness. And it was one of the most stressful experiences. It's been about two years since this experience. And I'm still looking back and saying, gosh, that like that visceral response to stress that I had weighing on my shoulders, I think a little bit of that is still present. And I think trauma is a very buzzword in culture today, but I think the experience of downsizing out of a home that you've been in for 20 plus years where you raised your kids on a dime because health has changed is a very traumatic experience. So I second all of your interviewees and say planning is definitely better than waiting until it's a need. And I pitch it, not pitch, but I share with people my parents' experience that now that my mom, so my mom is a widow. I'll just give you the whole story. 2020, dad was diagnosed with stage four cancer. It was rather traumatic and kind of a surprise. 2021, my mom calls me and says, okay, it's time to move. Dad can't go up the stairs safely anymore. I'm like, okay, well, we knew this was coming, but now it's like here dad can't go upstairs or he's going to fall and we'll lose him before, you know, before the cancer takes its toll. So for quality of life, we've got to find a more accessible home. So we immediately start the home search. It's crazy how this was my passion and my career path. And then God was like, you're going to actually help your own family do this very thing. So we find a super cute bungalow, two bed three bed, two full bath. And it had a dinky, dinky, like not very nice old rickety porch with just two steps up in the back. 
However, that porch goes up into double doors, which goes into the primary bedroom, which has an attached bathroom with a step-in shower with only about a three-inch threshold. So, And it has an in-ground pool. So going back to that OT interview, first and foremost, when you interview your clients, now these clients are my parents, but because I knew that an in-ground pool was something that my parents wanted forever and ever, and uh. that we could tear out this dinky little porch and create a wonderful ramped um, outdoor living space, that this could be a perfect place. So while doing that in advance, when you can enjoy the amenities and enjoy the downsizing, the new adventure with your partner or even by yourself, it's going to be 10 times more fiscally responsible. It's going to be it's just going to be easier when you plan ahead. So that's how my parents' story played out. We ended up getting three full-size dumpsters and just dumped so much stuff. There was no methodical process. We're still asking my mom like, oh, do you have that? Blah, 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 blah. And she'll say, I think it went in the dumpster because it was it was imperative that they downsized and they downsized fast because dad couldn't get upstairs. So I use that personal experience now in sharing with clients that it, it probably would have been a lot less expensive, a lot less stressful had my parents done it when, when they became empty nesters. Okay. Our girls have left to college. Now they're, you know, starting careers. They're grown. We don't need this big house, but instead people wait until it becomes an Oh crap issue. And it's very stressful. I think one of the saddest things that happens to people is when they're in a situation, I see it all the time, like you do, where something happens and they have to make a decision that they have to move out of their house. A spouse passes away and the wife is left. I heard this last week from someone, the husband had always paid the bills. These mm. two owned a business together, a very, mm. very, very successful business. And she was very involved in the business, but her husband passed away. She had never written the checks, didn't know anything. And now these people are in themselves in this situation, just as you're saying, where they have to or feel they need to move. And it's just so sad, mm -hmm. just so sad. So along with that, we know that making informed decisions is a better thing to do and much better than what you and I call crisis driven decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. But many people face either financial challenges or emotional challenges or trust challenges. They don't know who to trust. So in that case, how do you help them navigate those challenges? Yeah, so Empowered Homes, we strive to not be just a realtor. And as an occupational therapist, with that like hat and that heart and that education, it is a very holistic practice. So helping people make those challenging decisions is a, is a holistic um, flow chart, if you will. First, it's assessing what are the needs, and then it's going out of our way to offer kind of that white glove concierge service to minimize the stress that exists in that in that moment. So, an example of that, another need that I saw is that even when people have the utmost of resources, when they're in crisis, they need to guard those resources because maybe husband, wife is in the hospital, they're paying out of pocket for ridiculous chemotherapy treatment. And so um, luxury services like a mover or a declutterer is not always on the top of somebody's list of where they can immediately justify their but spending their budget. So I created a program called Students Helping Seniors, where I partner with local universities and seniors or seniors, students can get professional development units, which is the equivalent to our professional like CEUs, but they can get professional development units towards their advanced degrees, their master's in occupational therapy, maybe the doctorate in physical therapy. I've had social workers, I've had nurses, and they, they will just donate an hour, two hours of their time. And with five students and five hours of work, that really changes the lives of these families when they're making such a drastic transition. So being able to orchestrate programs like that and offerings like that is how I um, really aim to bring the stress level down when people have those crisis driven decisions to make. And do you use those people a lot? Do you use your students often? 
Yes, I will say that this summer has been hard. They're all out enjoying summer. Oh. Um, but yes, it, and it's really fun. It's a fun program because the the client usually loves interacting with a young sure. whippersnapper student that's, you know, excited about getting out in the field and they haven't been jaded by healthcare yet. So they're really excited to help people. And um, and it's just beautiful to to see a 22, 23 year old drop a Friday afternoon to come help somebody who just had a stroke and has to downsize. So I I love it. And I'm sure that a lot of those students have grandparents that they love that they maybe left behind while they came to college or that that aren't alive anymore. And I'm sure that that also brings out some memory of them helping their, having their grandparents in their life. And maybe it's, you know, it's really good for them also. So yeah, uh, yeah I can see that great program. You know, I, yeah, I hear stories often from, as from our shows, you know, people will say, oh yeah, it reminded me of my grandma when I was, um, you know, I, I, lo- I loved hearing stories from my grandma, but now she's not around anymore. So anyway, um, so we know that about 92% of the people want to stay in their home. We hear that statistic, but very few of them get to. So where is that gap? And is it possible to ever close it or do we need to? Or are there are are they just not realistic? I maybe this is not maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but my hypothesis kind of goes with an analogy. So if we know that the last time they published statistics about accessible housing in the U.S., less than 1% of all built construction, all existing homes were accessible. And their use of the term accessible was for somebody that was using a wheelchair. So maybe it still had one or two steps, which doesn't work for somebody that's using a walker or a cane because that's a huge fall risk. So I think it's even less than that 1%. In 2011, a study showed that it was actually 0.15%, but we haven't seen another study since then. So somewhere between 0.15% and 1% of the existing housing stock in the U.S. is accessible. So we have 93 or over 90% of seniors saying they want to stay in their homes, but we have less than 1% of the homes that actually work for people. That's a good point. I think if you look at... um, a, a stream clean team. So you have a river that has trash in it and there's people at the bottom of the stream taking the trash out, taking the trash out, but they're not going upstream to where the source of the trash is. The problem is never going to change. So if our home builders and developers don't see this this crisis happening, then we're never going to be able to close that gap. Another way that we can go upstream is to educate educate 50, 50 to good health, 50 to 60 year old, maybe even 45 year olds, people that are buying that home that they want to be in forever, the truly forever home. You have the home that you raise your kids in, and then you have the home that everybody says they can pull me out of out in a bag home. That that home needs to be UD ready or universally designed ready, it needs to be able to be modified for a cost that doesn't blow the appraised value out of the water for the neighborhood. And and people just aren't receiving that education. And they're buying homes because it's close to their grandkids, but all the bedrooms are still upstairs and they're 55 years old. Yes, I get that you play pickleball every day and you're in super great health, but that's only, you know, I don't know how how long you will have that luxury. So it's two things. It's education of the home buyer and education of the home builder. So let's segue off of this and let's talk about universal design just for a minute. What is universal design? What does that really mean? Yeah, I love this topic. So stop me if I go way too long, okay. but universal design. Well, that's is, right. We can have you back for another yeah. show. That's all right. <laughs> you should have my business partner on the custom joy side. She loves the universal design as much as I do. But universal design is a way of planning a space or a product proactively and for it to work for all types of people, no matter what their ability or age. So if you think about accessibility, that is a byproduct of disability. So accessibility was created because disabilities were in place. 
However, universal design is a proactive way of designing that's going to benefit a two-year-old, the same that it's going to work for a 102-year-old and everybody in between. So some universal design features, if you will, um, just to bring it into residential real estate would be a zero step entry into a house. That's going to benefit a senior the same way that it's going to benefit a multitasking mom carrying a baby and a pumpkin seat and groceries in the other hand. It creates ease for all types of people or the same way it'll benefit your three-year-old as he's clumsy and learning how to go from running to walking, et cetera. So it's a feature that benefits all people, all ages of all abilities and isn't a reactive measure like accessibility is. Interesting. So do you see in your area or in any place else where home builders are making changes to their designs now? Because if we believe, and we know the statistics say that 11,000 people per day are turning 65. So that really doesn't mean they're older when they turn 65, but I mean, certainly the trend is in that direction. So if we believe the population is going to turn older and more people are going to be alive in that phase of their life. So shouldn't we be then approaching our marketing and our businesses on that standpoint and shouldn't home builders? Yes. So I will give a shout out to two home builders locally in St. Louis. One is a custom home builder. So he is a little bit higher price point, luxury home, infill home builder. That's his name's Compass Mm -hmm. Design Build. And he's been doing universal design before he even knew it was called universal design. I let him know, hey, these smart homes you're building, this is universal design. So way to go, Compass. And then another one in St. Louis is um, a larger production. They're uh, medium to large size. So they're doing a lower price point, anywhere between three to six, seven hundred thousand dollars. So kind of more accessible price points. And they incorporated, they're called consort homes, and they incorporated a universal design floor plan that they market when they have clients come in to build a home and they say, here are the universal design features you can add to your new construction. So I do think it is gaining traction. If you ask somebody on the West and East Coast, definitely gaining traction. You have to remember I'm in the mighty Midwest and we're a little bit slower to to engage in most things. <laughs> um, but there there are a lot of um, a lot of avenues for education on universal design, one being the Universal Design Summit that happens biannually, and it is uh, conducted by the Starkloff Disability Institute. So there's a lot of a lot of traction in the movement. It just will take adoption of the consumer so that the home builders will get on board. And what's interesting is that the majority of home builders are older. Like mm-hmm. These are companies that have been around for a long time. Shea Homes, Toll Brothers, right? These companies have been around a long time. So they um, you know, should have a little bit more of an understanding, but they just don't think about that. So what's the most common request you get from from customers, from your new customers when someone comes in and they're thinking about moving? Is there a, a common question that they have or reason they come to you other than relationships, which we certainly understand? Yeah, I would say the three biggest um, areas that people don't have in their existing home that causes a move is a bedroom and bathroom on the main floor or an area of entry. So in the Midwest, we have walkout basements. If you could get a bathroom, bedroom, kitchenette on the main floor or on the um, basement level, that has its own entry, that's workable. But a lot of times they're still building these two-story homes with no bedrooms and bathrooms on the main floor. So it's a bed and bath on the main floor. And then it's, I guess that's, I put two in one. And then the second one is just entry. A lot of people can't get into their homes after their health is hindered in any way, because in St. Louis, especially the closer you get to our city center, the more steps we have, the old city homes, they all have steps to get to them. And even out in the County, our suburb areas, new home builders are still given the obligatory one to two steps to enter. And it just makes no sense to me. I think every home builder should raise the garage floor and create a zero step entry so that, so that there's a zero step entry to get into the home. But not everybody does that. Um, so those are the two things, the bedroom the or the three things, the bedroom, the bathroom, and the entry point of the home. Those are the things that are causing the major barriers. 
And it's interesting. I heard, excuse <clears throat> me, I heard a statistic recently that if people can buy single story homes right now, they should be gobbling them up because there aren't more being built because more houses on smaller lots and the value of having single story as people age is going to be increasingly important. So that's um, it's very interesting. When as in your role, Gretchen, as an OT, were you ever asked to evaluate homes before people were discharged from your from your community or from your facility where you were? Yes, that's a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that. But that was like one of my primary roles in both settings, the inpatient rehab hospital and in the skilled or the senior living community. I I somehow just always gravitated towards the home. This was just a thing inside of me. So I always signed up to be on those committees. We always had specialized committees within um, the OT world. So you could be on the Parkinson's treatment team. You could be on the amputee team. You could be on the home evaluation team. And I always gravitated towards home evaluations. And that was another, you know, just arrow in the quill of like, gosh, this is a problem. These people's homes. And it drove me nuts that insurance would be like, okay, you get 30 minutes, go tell them everything that's wrong with their home. (laughs) And there would be no compensation for follow-up or carryover. It was just giving people a laundry list of all the things that they needed to change. Everything from get rid of these throw rugs on top of each other. Like, I don't understand why you have five rugs on top of each other, but they've got to go because you're going to fall on your face all the way up to tearing out the front steps, regrading the front yard and creating a zero step entry. So like the scope of the work was grand and we were giving them no resources. And so that was another, like, I'm not actually helping. I'm only hurting and probably making people feel really bad about the homes that they live in. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. So did the insurance companies then give you a budget to deal with that or just you got, they just paid for you to go tell them what was wrong. Yeah. In the clinical role, it was merely an assessment. There was no intervention or follow-up. So it was merely 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, depending on how medically complex the person was. Um, and so it was just get in there. Don't talk to me. Don't ask questions. I'm looking at the house and here's a list and good luck. And so that felt a little maddening as well. You've mentioned that you dislike leaving your job with 104 cases um, without providing people a list of solutions. So was there ever a follow-up system in place or did people ever reach back to you or were you able to do that with them? Once I left, no, because just because I didn't want to cross the line of, um, you know, non-disclosures and non-competes, et cetera. But in this line of work now that I am not, um, I'm not reimbursed through Medicare, there are, you know, OT entrepreneurs that run their business and do get reimbursed through Medicaid, Medicare, private payer insurances. Um, I am strictly private pay and get paid through the the commission of a home sale. So I'm able to add some of those very um, skilled services that an OT can offer, but get paid out of the equity of somebody's home through commission and, and not have them pay me up front, which helps. So in this role, I get to basically do whatever I want because I'm not mandated by, by insurance payers. But in my previous role, the follow-up was very lacking. And that was one of the broken things of the system that just made me realize we're not making a change here. We're just funding insurance pay, you know, we're just making the large machine a lot of money because our productivity is great. So that was disheartening. And how often are you asked to conduct evaluations now? Weekly. I have people reaching out all the time. Um, And what's really cool is that my my colleagues, I'm a part of the largest brokerage in St. Louis. And so we have about four to 500 agents in our office. And they all know me as the very passionate nerd who is super excited about accessibility. So now I get to partner with agents locally and nationally to serve their clients because they recognize they don't have the OT backgrounds, but they want to bring a rock star on their team to help them close a deal or to help their clients understand if they should 
if they should make an offer on a house and and that investment is small versus buying a house and realizing down the road, this is not going to work for us long term. So just last week, a realtor, I did a um, home assessment for a realtor um, and it's called our aging in place plan. We should call it our living in place plan after I've told you how I feel about that, but it's called the aging in place plan. And we just provide similar to what you would get from a clinical OT, but a lot more detail because I don't have an insurance um, payer breathing down my neck. It's anywhere between five to 15 pages of here's how this house will not work. Here's how this house will work. Here are some things you can do. Here's estimated budget, et cetera. I'm fascinated with this partnership that you have with other agents. And I spent a minute looking at it, a few minutes, I should say, looking at it and how you partner with other realtors. I think it's brilliant, first of all, that you don't, that you see that an opportunity because a lot of realtors are very competitive and they don't want to share information or work with each other. But how you've made that not only a small business for yourself, Mm -hmm. um, but also in a, a way of a service because other realtors don't have this background and to be able to bring you in and ask you to help them with that evaluation, I think is really right, smart. Right. Just like we have our electricians in our back pocket that will tell our clients what the cost is going to be to make the panel safe. It's just another tool in agent's toolbox to make them look like a rock star. And I always position myself as a partner on the agent's team and say like accessibility consultant, not realtor from St. Louis. I wear that OT hat to partner on their team. Sure. Sure. So it seems to me that getting information, I'm sure you'll agree, getting information to the public about this broad topic mm -hmm. of living in their home and all the parts that goes with it, which we haven't even had the time to touch on this morning, mm -hmm. but getting information to the public is crucial. So how do you see this happening and what are some effective ways to spread the knowledge and to get the information out to more people? Yeah, unfortunately, we are a very reactive society. Our healthcare yeah. system is one that is very reactive. It's very much so sick care, not health care. The funding for proactive visits and mammograms and skin checks, it, it's hard to get those things paid for. But once you have an illness, they'll pay for it. And so I think our society in, in the USA anyway, is set up a little bit for failure in this realm. So once that mindset mindset shifts, it won't be until then that that I think the demand will be there. And so unfortunately, most people don't think about it until it becomes an oh crap issue. So it's just sharing personal experiences, sharing those, you know, sad but amazing stories of the clients we get to serve of um, how people will be able to experience dignity and joy at the end of life because they proactively made this move that that put them in a place that a hospital bed could fit in. And now they could die at home with their loved ones and they don't have to go to hospice to a hospice house that doesn't resemble their home and has strange people. Like, no, that is not what I want for my end of life. Um, so getting the information out is the largest barrier that I see. And it's really just um, weaving it into everything that I do. That's how I, that's how I educate people. Not one person really, if anybody knows me more than my name, they know that I am a super passionate occupational therapist and realtor that marries the two. And, and it just is in everything that I eat, breathe, share online, et cetera. And seeing you as the serial entrepreneur that you are, I expect that something will change soon and that you'll have some program that will be a national program that you'll be sharing this information. I, I wish just can I kind of been. guess that that might happen. I, I wish I'm not that I could do that. that. <laughs> I I'm, think I'm legislative sure, sure changes that. need to happen. Everybody's concerned with how they can save their money or make more money. So if legislation could go into effect that people would get major tax cuts if they made their home universally designed, then people will listen. And there, those things are in the works behind the scenes. There are some great lobbyists that are doing that work. Um, I just don't have the, I don't have the bandwidth. <laughs> no, but I, see, I also can see you uh, um, educating other realtors, how they can bring in someone as a partner not a competitor, but as mm -hmm. a partner and how they can make some changes in the home or get some advice before they put that person in the home. 
I, something that you've done that fascinates me is the joy of home. Let's take a minute to talk about the joy of home. What does that really mean? And I think you were involved in a study on what is joy of home? What does it mean? And what truly brings joy to a home? Yeah, so I made that our our like slogan, delivering the joy of home is what Empowered Homes is all about. And I got that when I was folding laundry in my basement for my two small children and husband and rolling my eyes at how how tall the laundry pile was while listening to a podcast on positioning statements and how important it is as a small business to not tell people you know, what you do at a high level, but tell people the emotion that they will feel when they work with you, how they will feel after you conduct your service. And so the the word that just kept coming back is joy. Because another thing that I've always written on my notebooks and kept at the top of um, the top of, you know, my my whiteboards is when my husband and I were in our premarital counseling, we had this counselor that would tell us, Home is where you hear the voice that calls you beloved. And while he was oh. referring to it as relationally, like your person should always make you feel safe and secure, it's exactly how I feel about home. Home should not make you feel like a cap, you know, like you're a cap, uh, like you're trapped. Home should not make you feel like you are being pressed down or um, like you're being held back. It should make you feel so safe and secure. And all of those words just kept pointing to joy. So that's why I I agree. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you share a few stories of people who you've impacted and that you remember these stories and something you did or how you changed their life and how that then in, in turn changed your life? Yeah. So I have a couple real time um, one, one real time is a, a woman reached out. She got my information from an OT in inpatient hospital. I have no idea who this occupational therapist is. So I'm so grateful that people are spreading the news and she calls me and tells me that she still works. She was going to retire this year. Uh, but now her husband had a stroke while getting a um, benign brain tumor removed. So the tumor wasn't even cancerous, but in surgery, he had a stroke and he is now completely dependent, um, for all of his ADLs and IADLs um, activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. And so they live in a two story, beautiful brick colonial home that has only a powder room on the main floor. And he is currently, well, was currently, sleeping in a hospital bed in a dining room and they would check into a hotel once a week or every other week. So he could get a proper shower or bath because they don't have a full bathroom on the main floor and the way that their kitchen is set up. It's beautiful. However, the Island is too close to the sink. They couldn't get the wheelchair up to do a sponge bath. So that breaks my heart. Like what you have to go to a hotel to get a shower. That is crazy. And praise the Lord that they have the resources to do that because a lot of people cannot afford to do that. So we went and looked at a couple. Well, first she tells me from an OT perspective, getting the whole picture, I learned that it's very important that they stay within this super hyper local area of St. Louis because their daughter just had their first grandbaby. So that's a big task. Like we got to keep grandma and grandpa close to the new grandbaby. And it needs to be accessible. So we've already talked about the statistics of existing construction. It was quite a task. I showed her one or two condos in the area. And she said, you know, we're, we don't want a condo. After seeing these, it's just not for us. I don't think so. Well, a third condo hits the market. I look at all the pictures before I send it to her because she's already made it clear we don't want a condo. And after I look at it five or six times, I'm like, you know, this looks like it could be a knockout option for them. There's no steps to get into either of the condo entrances. There's wide hallways. The bathroom is almost there. It needs a little modification, but the bathroom's huge. So we could we could really work sure. with this. So I take her. I say, I know. 
let's go look. And if you hate it, then we will never look at another sure. condo again. We walk in and the tears start flowing. So um, this feels like home. This doesn't feel like a condo. This feels like a really nice ranch style home. We've got to get it under contract. So competitive market for this type of condo in St. Louis, we get it under market or we get it under contract and was able to negotiate $15,000 off in inspections. And now we've flipped it over to Custom Joy, the construction company, and are working with getting bids and doing a floor plan. And when I talked to her just the other day, she told me, I know I've told you, but I can't tell you enough. Being in this condo has changed Mr. Home buyer's life. Like it is so dignifying that we can get them in and out of the bathroom. And this is before um, we've even modified the bathroom. It just works so much better than where they were. And so that one is like super near and dear to my heart. I'm listing their house, um, the two story colonial, and I haven't heard from them in a while. And I had that intuition that not that they don't want to use me to list, but that something was really wrong. And I finally got a hold of her last week and Mr. Byers in the hospital. He's going to be okay. But that really uh, being an empath and so deeply involved in my patient or clients lives that really sure. wore on me like, oh, no, is he okay? And so that's an example of of one person that we've, we're working with real time to get them into a place that will work so much better for them. And what... Uh gift you were to them because someone else would have said they don't want a condo mm, right mm -hmm. and not looked further but but you did that so that is pretty amazing um we have just a few minutes i've just a couple of other things i'd like to ask you about i see that you have the topic of housing beyond borders i think or living beyond borders i'm assuming that's not just a geographical phrase so what does living without borders mean? Um, I think you're referring to on my logo. Home without borders. Home, Excuse me. yes. Um, yeah, home without boundaries is what it says. Excuse and me. My, that's I okay. apologize. That's okay. It is It is just a, a, another, so like joy is the overarching feeling that everybody should feel in their home. Home without boundaries means a couple of things. One, physical boundaries should not be a part of our home because we're not given forever. Like we will all age. We will all experience hardship. We will all meet our maker. That is just part of life. Um, and I'm also super passionate about home ownership and just occupational justice and social justice. So home without without boundaries is just to represent that we fight for our clients every single time to achieve a home that works for them. And then I always tell people in listing appointments that we give back a portion of every, a large portion of every commission check to local nonprofits. And a lot of the, it changes every quarter, which nonprofit we're giving to, but a lot of the ones that we support are ones that are, um, combating homelessness in our city or giving people job training so that they can they can create wealth for their family through job and home ownership down the road. So it's kind of a twofold um, statement to just get get across our passions. I think I know the answer to this, but we have one minute left. So let me ask you, what gives you the greatest joy? Ooh, that's a great question. What what is that really that you say? Yes. Yes, I love being able to use my clinical skills to put a, a very complex puzzle together to bring other people joy. So I love helping people solve their problems. And that is what probably gives me my greatest joy. Well, certainly what gives us joy today is listening to you and having you on our show. Your passion is inspiring. It's mm -hmm. catching. It's energizing. And I'm fortunate that I've been able to get to know you and hear you in other um, places and see what you do for other people. Let me just ask one question. How many other OT realtors are there? That's a great question. And I should take, take count. I created a course two years ago called OT to RE. And I'll actually be relaunching that in Q4 this year but it was intended to bring more realtors into this space. And I know about 15 realtors were born out of that course all over the United States, but I haven't taken, haven't taken 
um, attendance since. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.